Okay, hands up, that's not me. This is my bike, but I do look just like the guy in the intro, and I do occasionally ride majestically across suspension bridges. In this video, I'm going to tell you what I think of the Honda CB500X after six months of ownership. I'll take you through the changes for the 2019 model, the modifications I've made, and the accessories I've added, the riding experience, why I chose the Honda over its competitors, the cost of ownership, including purchase price, insurance, servicing, and fuel economy, and conclude with five things I like and five things I wish Honda had spent a little bit more time developing. This is going to be quite a long and I hope comprehensive review, so if you're in the market for a mid-range dual sport motorcycle, grab yourself a drink, sit back and enjoy. So I bought this gleaming red Honda CB500X, new in April 2019, six months ago at the time of making this video, in which time I've covered about 2,500 kilometers along everything from motorways to dirt tracks. I also own a 2017 Triumph Street Triple, a 2018 Honda Monkey 125, 2018 Honda Vision Scooter, and I have a 2020 Triumph Rocket on order. So quite a broad range of bikes to compare the CB500X to. I did quite a bit of research into the dual sport market before I decided on the Honda, test riding a range of models from the Benelli TRK502 to the BMW 1250GS. So what made me go with the CBX in the end? Well, the first thing really was the way the bike looked and felt in the showroom. The red paintwork is very good quality with a nice deep shine to it. The fit and finish is excellent with good quality plastics though you don't quite get the milled from a single block of aluminium feel that you have with say a Triumph or a BMW. Perceived quality is way better though than on a Royal Enfield or a Benelli for example and certainly very acceptable for the price point. Colours available at least here in Europe are white, black and red. A greater choice perhaps with some more unusual paint colours would be nice, but we seem to be living in an age when all vehicles are either black, white or some shade of grey. Judging from online forums and Facebook groups, I would say that, at least for the 2019 model, red appears to be the most popular choice, followed by black and then white. I like the finish, but I'm not a huge fan of the camouflage decals on the side, particularly as while those on the tank have been clear coated over, the ones on the front fairings haven't. I originally thought this was an oversize on my bike, but it's common to all CBXs, which seems a slightly odd decision by Honda. I'm 6 foot 3 and about 85 kilos, and I immediately felt comfortable when I sat on the bike. Although it felt much taller and heavier than, say, my street triple, the narrow seat means I'm able to flat foot with no problem at all. The centre of gravity, though, is relatively high, and you can feel this particularly when manoeuvring in your garage or in and out of parking spots. I'd never dropped a bike before in my life, but I've managed to drop this bike twice in six months. I think this is down to my being unused to the relatively high centre of gravity, plus of course the fact that it does weigh the best part of 200 kilos. Fortunately, I fitted the engine crash bars and handguards soon after purchase, which prevented any serious damage. There were three obvious rivals back in April. The Benelli TRK502, the BMW 310GS and the Kawasaki Versus 300 and I diligently test rode all of them. I rejected the Benelli because it was too big for me physically and it felt a little bit agricultural as if it had been designed and built say 25 years ago. I didn't like the finish on the BMW, it's way off that found on, for want of a better expression, proper BMWs and the motor felt weak and unrefined after the Honda. Finally, I eliminated the Kawasaki because it too felt underpowered and I don't particularly care for their paint schemes. Since I got my Honda, of course, the Yamaha Tenere 700 has come out and this would, I think, have been a serious contender. 
but at nearly 10,000 euros it is 50% more or less more than the Honda and maybe a little more off-road oriented than I need. I've deliberately decided not to take one out for fear of preferring it over my CBX but if you're in the market for this style of bike the Tenere is probably the first bike you should be testing and comparing to the Honda. I immediately really felt at home on the CBX. It's the right size and the right height for me even if it is a bit top heavy. The ride is extremely comfortable though the soft suspension setup means the bike does dive a lot under braking. This is fine until you ride something like the BMW 1250GS with its magic suspension that doesn't budge at all under braking and then you realise just how soft the Honda's front end is. It's not dangerous of course, you just need to be aware of it. I asked my Honda dealer to install the twin USB socket before delivery. There's a blanking plug in the dash which doesn't look very nice but installation is straightforward and the cost was only about £45 or €40. Euros. It provides a very useful source of power for both my phone while navigating as you can see here and the helmet mounted GoPro I use to take these videos. As I do with all my bikes I fitted a pair of grip puppies to make the grips feel a bit fatter and to try and reduce some of the vibration because the CBX is rather a buzzy little bike above about 6,000 revs. The bars aren't too bad actually, the mirrors hardly vibrate at all but on a longish run, say after an hour or so, the vibrations through the foot pegs and the seat can become particularly uncomfortable. I also fitted a pair of semi-rigid SW Motec Blaze rear panniers because these provide enough uh, carrying capacity for a day trip without adversely affecting the way the bike looks. Of course you're never going to fit a helmet inside but there's plenty of space for tools, locks, sandwiches and wet weather riding gear. I fitted the SW Motec crash bars and handguards too mostly, or so I thought, to add a bit of style to the bike and make me look like a tough adventurer. However, as I already alluded to, I have dropped the bike twice since I got it and was therefore very glad to have this little bit of extra protection. I've done separate videos on all the aforementioned accessories, so feel free to check them out if you want more detail. Finally, I installed a Ram Mount X grip on the very handy accessory bar that Honda fit as standard to the CBX from the 2019 model year onwards. You can see it here in this video. Uh, a simple device, very well made, a little bit expensive, but it does hold the phone perfectly and I've had no issues of any type uh, during riding, be it off-road or motorway. For the first time ever, I haven't bothered with a tail tidy on this bike as I don't really think it's that necessary. But I have of course fitted a radiator guard as the front mud guard is very short and does little to protect the radiator from flying stones. Now the tyres, uh, when it comes time to change them I may well swap out the original tyres for some more road oriented rubber as I rarely venture off road and when I do it's more dusty gravel like this uh, than enduro. The original tyres are okay on the road but not nearly as confidence inspiring as say the Pirelli courses I have on my street triple. Having said that of course they are much more versatile and I shudder to think what my triumph would be like on a gravel track like this. The CBX can feel a bit jittery on painted road markings and I've had several micro slides even in the dry on straight ahead arrows in particular. This may just be an issue in Portugal though as I haven't ventured into Spain on the CBX yet, maybe they use grippier paint. So what's the Honda CB500X like to live with every day? In a word, easy. When I passed my bike license a few years ago, before the current progressive license system came into force, I went straight out and bought a Triumph Daytona. Now, I'm in my 50s, so I refrain from too much mucking about on a bike, but even I quickly realised that I should really have started on something a bit more user-friendly. An A2 compliant bike like the Honda CB500X. This basically means that you're limited to a bike with 48 horsepower or less 
for the first two years after you pass your test. Having initially dismissed this as more unnecessary interference from the nanny state, I now realise that I would have learned the art of motorcycling far more quickly if I'd begun on a bike like the CB500X. It's got enough power, but not so much that you can't use it on the public roads. It's comfortable, the clutch and gear shift are easy to operate, the brakes are good enough, I suppose, though a twin disc setup would have been nice. You're protected from most of the wind blast, it's economical, and most importantly, you probably won't end up on the wrong side of a hedge. So what's it like in an urban situation like this? Well, the switch gear is nice to operate, though around town the throttle requires delicate feathering because the fueling is not quite as good as it could be, particularly at low revs. A little bit jerky from time to time. The bike's also relatively wide, which combined with the slight top-heavy feeling and less than perfect fueling at low revs means it's not brilliant for filtering. It's okay, but the street triple, for example, is easier to thread through traffic. Of course, neither of these bikes can hold a candle to the Vision scooter when it comes to city duties. But on the CBX, the relatively high riding position does give you a commanding view of traffic and you can easily peer into Q7s and BMW X5s at traffic lights. And what's it like in the twisties then? Well, I've been surprised by just how nimble the bike feels through the bends. And I've even seen people on forums taking their CBX to the track. It feels light, it feels flickable, even compared to my street triple, which is often considered as a reference. And it's surprisingly easy to lean. It would be even better at this if the tyres were more road-oriented, though this is remedied easily enough if you don't intend doing any off-road. There's enough power to catapult you out of each corner, even if you do begin to run out of steam fairly quickly and suffer vibrations on the straights. Overall though, a surprisingly sporty feel for a dual sport, and power aside, it's much easier to have fun with than, say, the big BMW 1250 GS. So, motorways and longer trips. Now, as a rule, I don't really enjoy motorbikes on the motorway. I just feel too exposed, and the long straight lines kind of take all the fun out of things. And indeed, the motorway is where I enjoy the CBX the least. Two main culprits here, I think. The lack of power above about 65, 70 miles an hour, 120 kilometers an hour and the ever-present vibrations you get through the seat, the pegs and the handlebars above five, six thousand revs. So if you're looking for a bike to be used mainly as a motorway cruiser, a fast motorway cruiser, then the Honda CBX is perhaps not your best choice. Now, how about off-road? Well, let me come clean from the start. I have very little experience off-road and generally do not feel particularly comfortable taking a 200 kilo inherently unstable piece of machinery on slippery, gravelly, uneven surfaces. I just don't have the skills. Having said that, the CBX is as competent as I was expecting it to be. The suspension soaks up the bumps and the tyres do a reasonable job of holding on. Ground clearance is fine for me, but I know that the first thing a lot of owners do is fit a bash plate to replace the all but useless plastic belly pan that Honda gives you. I have tried standing up uh, out of the seat, but the handlebars are a little bit too low for my six foot three frame. And of course, the light off-roading I do doesn't really require much out of the seat work. So what are the costs involved of buying and owning a Honda CB500X? Well, the purchase price here in Portugal is about 6,800 euros, including VAT. That's going to be about just over 6,000 pounds. The total cost of the accessories 
I added uh, panniers, crash bars, hand guards, USB charging point and the grip puppies was about 600 euros or 530 pounds. Over the 2000 kilometers that I've ridden I have averaged 3.1 liters per 100 kilometers uh, fuel consumption which is about 90 92 miles per gallon which is really an excellent result for a bike of this size insurance well obviously this varies from person to person depending on your age no claims how you use the bike and where you park it and of course every country is different but for what it's worth I'm 56 years old maximum no claims personal use of the bike only uh, I park it in a locked garage every night and my insurance uh, works out at 236 euros or about 210 pounds per annum fully comprehensive um, I've only done uh, 2,000 kilometers so I've only had the 1,000 kilometer braking service uh, a couple of months ago and uh, that was 99 euros or about 88 pounds so by way of a conclusion to this video I'm now going to list the top five things that I like about the Honda CB500X number one the overall comfort the seat the riding position and the suspension are all excellent as soon as I took the bike out on a test ride I was smitten by just how easy it is to ride and it's the most comfortable bike I've ever owned or ridden number two the size I'm six foot three and about 85 kilos and so I like a larger bike my street triple for example is on the small side but strangely I feel perfectly comfortable on our vision scooter I'm not so much talking about how bent my legs are for example but more how at ease you feel sitting on the bike and riding it the CBX fits me like a glove number three the cost of ownership it's cheap to buy and cheap to run not as cheap as our vision scooter of course which is so cheap it basically feels like free transport but for a big bike the CBX is very frugal and cheap to insure number four the exhaust pop a trivial point perhaps but for a stock exhaust on a fairly ordinary engine it does sound pretty good and there's a nice pop on overrun finally number five the fit and finish of this bike for the price point the build quality really is excellent not quite up to the best standards of Triumph or BMW but more than acceptable for the price you're paying and finally the top five things that I don't like or rather how I would make the bike perfect if I had a magic wand number one simple a CB650X with about 80 horsepower for me would be spot on the 500's lack of power can only really be felt above about 110 120 kilometers an hour uh, 65 70 miles an hour but it would be nice to have a few more horses to play with when overtaking for example I always say that if you have never ever used full throttle on a bike or in a car then you have enough power well I do have the throttle on maximum quite a lot on the Honda on the plus side of course this does ensure the bike remains easy to ride number two and this is something I haven't touched on actually um, I would like better instruments a better dashboard it's better than the old one uh, but I find much of the information is too small to read easily the speed and the gear indicator are okay but reading fuel consumption or the distance on the trip counter on the fly requires too much of my attention the display also looks as if it hasn't switched on properly it's backlit and in color though you'd be hard-pressed to see this on a sunny day it's okay at night but I do 99% of my riding during the day so that's not much help to me um, compared to the recently revealed 2020 Africa Twin with its full color mini iPad display Apple CarPlay and Android Auto the CBX's instruments are pretty unspectacular 
Number three, less vibration. This is probably the thing I find most annoying about the CBX. My dealer suggested I just need to ride past the vibration, uh, but it's pretty much there all the time once you hit five, six thousand revs. And on the motorway, for example, you quickly develop tingly fingers and feet. Number four, better wind protection. The screen can be set in a low or a high position with a tool, uh, but neither setting gives my head much protection. I know I can fit an aftermarket screen, but I object to replacing bits I've already paid for, particularly when it would have cost Honda only a few pennies more to make the screen a couple of inches higher. And finally, number five, better low speed fueling. It's not quite as good as it could be, and you need to be careful on the throttle and clutch to get a smooth ride around town. I've seen worse, but Honda are usually spot on with this kind of thing, so slightly disappointing. So should you buy a Honda CB500X or not? As I mentioned, I have three other bikes in the garage, a Street Triple, a Monkey and a Scooter, and I have a Triumph Rocket on order. If new legislation dictated that we could only own one motorcycle, I would, perhaps a little reluctantly, have to get rid of the others and keep the CB500X. Now I say reluctantly only because while it's a very versatile machine, at home nipping down to the shops or tearing down a forest track, it's not the kind of bike you turn around one last time to stare at as you leave your garage. In a nutshell, it's a bike to be used rather than loved. And for that reason, I'll be hanging on to mine for many years to come. As always, thanks for watching.